get starting. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be here today uh, for our national double coming out uh, virtual town hall, where we're going to be having a huge um, amount of folks listening today, and also a very amazing panel um, from immig uh, from organizations such as Immigration Equality, Get Equal, the Familia Trans Queer Liberation uh, Movement, and also from United We Dream. And all the folks here today are undocumented and, uh, and queer folks um, that have been part of their of creating this large overall movement. Um, so we're very excited to have all of you here today. Um, just to give you a little bit, a little bit of brief uh, of understanding on why we're doing this today. Um, on October 11, um, it was National Coming Out Day, um, and for many of us that live undocumented and uh, uh, LGBT experiences, the coming out experience is one that we have to do twice. Um, so the purpose of today's uh, virtual town hall is for folks to understand more of our unique experiences and also the similarities that we face as LGBT and as immigrants, um, as undocumented immigrants specifically, and also what are what is the intersectionality of LGBT and immigrant rights movements. Um, so, uh, so for you all that don't know me, my name is Carlos Padilla. I'm the national coordinator for the Queer and Documented Immigrant Project, which is a program of United We Dream, um, and it's an immigrant youth-led movement. Um, so my preferred gender pronoun is him and her, um, and I am from the state of Seattle, Washington. So if we can start off by all of you introducing yourself and the organization that you represent and a little bit about what your organization is doing. So maybe you want to start off, Alan? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alan, and I am from Familia, the trans liberation movement. My preferred gender pronouns are they, them, and he. And we are a national LGBTQ um, trans organization that works on not one more um, campaigns and also on family accepting campaigns. Thank you so much. Um, maybe we can go off uh, into Maida. Hi, everybody. Maida Hidalgo Salazar. I'm originally from Naranjo, Alejuela, Costa Rica. I uh, grew up in a small town, Lakeland, Florida, and I'm with the United We Dream Network. I'm currently serving as their board treasurer. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can go into Marco. Hey, everyone. My name is Marco Antonio Caroga. Um, my preferred, uh, preferred gender pronouns are he, him, and his. And I'm from Lima, Peru. I grew up in Orlando, Florida, so the great sunshine state. I am currently living in New York, uh, and I'm the national field officer for immigration equality. Essentially, what we do, we're, we're the, na the largest national um, LGBT immigrant rights organization, over 20 years old and provide the most uh, non-pro uh, um, bono free legal services to asylum seekers and getting LGBT individuals out of detention. Thank you so much, Marco. Uh, maybe you want to introduce yourself, uh, Dago? Perfect. Hello, everybody. I'm Dago um, Bailon from well known in DC, but previously in Phoenix, Arizona. And we're um, the Arizona Quip chapter, so we're doing a lot of work in educating, and um, currently we're building resources um, for or undocu queer brothers and sisters. And Luis, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Luis Aguilera Garcia. Um, I am living in North Carolina, but I grew, but I was born in um, Guerrero, Mexico. I am the immigration coordinator for Get Equal. And um, so Get Equal does a lot of um, empowering, empowerment for LGBTQ immigrants and um, people in the, across the country. And right now we are um, stepping up the call for full federal equality for not only LGBTQ people, but LGBTQ um, immigrants as well. So very happy to be here. And my preferred gender pronouns are he, his, him. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, so for the audience that's out listening today, um, you all can continue following the conversation uh, while you're watching us live and also on Twitter with the hashtags uh, double coming out. So any questions that you might have during this, uh, this panel discussion of, coming out, of our coming out experiences, you can tweet at us at United Would Dream, also at Immigration Equality, um, and you can uh, be checking into their, uh, uh, to their website to check in out more about what, they're, uh, what we're uh, following the conversation on social media. So 
Um, we're going to start off with some of the questions that we have, and I wanted to hear what is your experiences uh, on the matters that we're about to speak of, um, and also just some of the knowledge that you'll hold based on your activism and leadership that you've done around your communities. Um, so the first question that we have is, with the understanding that people migrate to, because of various reasons, can you share with us what are some of the factors for queer migration based on the work that you've done um, in your prospective organizations? So I don't know who wants to take up the first question. Maybe you can go, Marco? Sure, I'd love to. So here at Immigration Equality, we're the largest national service provider for asylum seekers. And essentially, these are individuals who face uh, abuse, persecution, rape, beatings, uh, um, death threats against their lives uh, uh, in over 80 countries around the world is criminalized to be LGBT and many more countries around the world it's actually extraordinarily dangerous to be out and proud and so for these individuals they migrate here seeking safety and security in the United States for them it's not an option to go back to Uganda, Nigeria um, trans women from El Salvador, Honduras they face extraordinarily violent, extraordinary violence and so we, we're the ones who provide services here to, um, to give them that type of relief. But we're also combating uh, uh, the current broken immigration system so that we can change the practices and uh, policies that negatively affect our community. And that's what we've been focusing on as of yet. Thank you so much, Marco. Um, maybe if you want to speak a little bit more about... Uh the queer migration um, island that you've seen within the work that uh, Familia has been doing? Yeah. So um, in Familia, we are doing a lot of um, family acceptance work. You know, there's this notion that Latino and uh, Latina families are homophobic, and we're trying kind of to destigmatize that and really bring out the idea that it's not that our communities are homophobic, but the idea that as people that are people of color, um, queer, trans, they're not conforming. It's, it's not homophobia, it's that we have our basic needs, right? If we have our basic needs met, then we can begin thinking about things like gender fluidity, sexual orientation. But when we don't, ha when we don't have those basic needs, because we're trying to fight off uh, immigration or healthcare or any other kind of institution, it's harder for us to really talk about our intersecting identities and who we are as a people that are not just people of color, but are also queer and gender, of gender variance. Um, so it's really having those courageous conversations and opening up the space for dialogue in a place where it hasn't been provided because we have to think about all the other things that affect us before we can think about our um, gender, um, sexual, and race, and all the other intersections in between. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's definitely, I think that you hit on you hit right on the key, and for many, for my personal experience, I know that's for a matter of fact. So I don't know if anybody else on the pan, you know, any of you folks want to share your thoughts. Okay. Um, so I think I mean, is there something that you would like to share, uh, Luis or or Maida or Lago? Um, I just wanted to piggyback off of what Marco said um, about um, how not only are we trying to fight like hom the homophobic society that we have here, but the work that I see that Gerico is doing is doing a lot of grassroots, um, like building, empowering the um, LGBTQ people on a local level so that they can fight against injustices and um, things like that so that we can actually build power from the ground up so that we can win like battles for full federal equality whether it's for um, health care, marriage, um, fighting criminalization and not only for people of color but also for women um, just across the whole board um, building that strong team on the on the on lower level so yeah. Thank you. Ed. Maida, um, can you still, are you still hearing, can you hear, t can you hear us? I can hear better now. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, yes. I was going to add that that's definitely, I think, um, a huge priority for me personally is combating the criminalization 
of undocumented, all undocumented people, um, especially our undocu queers. I come from a county, um, Polk County is the county I grew up in, and my county has the second is the second most sued county <laughs> for civil rights violations in this country. Um, Sheriff Joe Arpaio has us beat at number one. Uh, so I think. Uh, when we talk about coming out, we also have to take into consideration that many of our undocu queers, um, what kept me from coming out was just a, a matter of survival. I was living in a semi-rural space um, where it wasn't okay to be Latina. It wasn't very less okay to be undocumented. I felt like coming out as queer would add even more complications into my life uh, because of the space and the, um, the climate around, around my identities. Uh, so I think uh, combating criminalization at the local level needs to be of highest priority in order for us to see the change we want. Um, and whether that means we need to, you know, break ICE agreements county by county, um, that's what we need to do. But that's that, before we can talk about coming out as both queer and undocumented, I think those are things that need to be addressed because without that, um, people are just fighting to, to survive every day. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that's continues to hit on the point, especially with our communities and how we uh, address our criminalization um, as an everyday experience for us. Anything that you'd like to add, Dagoberto? I mean, everybody's um, really talked about and hit the points, um, but I think um, I think it is extremely important that that we focus our attention on not just um, not just um, taking down these. Um, Laws, right? But essentially, giving our community the tools to continue to um, to lead different movements, right? And not only movements, but but to take on different causes. Because as we grow as a movement, as undocu queer, we're got, we're complex people, so different things are going to come up. So we need to make sure that um, that we're actually educating and giving our community the tools to um, to continue to move forward together. Thank you so much. I mean, I think you're all continue to hitting on the on the right. Uh, the right points, because you know we live those experiences. So, um, I wanted to share a recent um, a report that uh, United We Dream, in partnership with Own the Dream and Unbound, uh, did um, on the recent recipients with the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival. So, we um, surveyed approximately 3,400 people, I believe it was, and out of that, um, from the folks that identified as LGBT and undocumented. Only 36% of them had come out as both uh, LGBT and undocumented. 32% of them had come out as only undocumented but not LGBT. 14% of them had come out as LGBT and not undocumented. And 19% of them had not come out as either or. So when we continue to speak about, you know, what is it easier to come out, um, I wanted to hear, I mean, what has been your personal experiences but also being um, critical on like why is it that our experience is different from some of our other colleagues, of other folks that are you know in this in our movement. So I wanted to hear um, you know what one what was the first thing that you came out as whether it was undocumented or LGBT um, and you know did it became easier to come out as a second one or did it became harder? Um, kind of want to know more about your coming out experience. This is Maida. Um, I came out as undocumented before coming out as queer. Um, I don't know if I can say one was more difficult or complex than the other, but I will say that um, often we see coming out as this like idealistic, liberatory thing, um, and and I think we we also need to take into consideration that when you come out either as undocumented or as queer or as both, you are exposing yourself to violence. Um, as a young woman, as a, as a queer woman, that was a very real thing. Um, just with the community organizing work um, that was happening back in my county, if anyone was doing any kind of work around enforcement, you had police officers um, fall around you know, police cars following them around, and I think um, looking, you know, looking for you to, to slip up or happen to be behind the wheel because they already know you're undocumented. Um, so it, we, we paint this as, as a liberatory um, act, and I think it is in many ways, 
But I think in all of that, we, um, we forget the complexities that come with the different spaces that we all live in. And I know the space I lived in, um, coming out as queer and coming out as undocument, undocumented was definitely exposing myself and making me vulnerable to violence from my community. Yeah, so I'd like to, to add off of that. Um, you know, I came out as undocumented first, and it came out of necessity. I was in high school. I, I was reaching my senior year. I didn't have any opportunities available to me. My parents, my mom was really working hard to figure out what was the next steps after graduation. I was talking to my guidance counselor about it. They had no idea what it meant to be undocumented. They didn't have any advice for me. And uh, um, I just had to represent myself as an undocumented youth because uh, I had to figure out what, what was the next opportunity for me in my life. And so uh, the biggest fear I had, I was just scared coming out as gay uh, because I didn't have support from, my, from society. And so coming out as gay uh, put me at risk of losing support from the only support system I had in this world, which was my family. And uh, when I did come out as gay, um, I, I went through a period of time where I was homeless. I was living on the streets because I couldn't face my mother. I couldn't face that disappointment. I couldn't face her looking at me with uh, um, all the optimism she held in her heart for a bright future and what she imagined my my life would be here in the U.S. and what I would provide my family, which was to get married, to have a great job, to um, have children. And I couldn't face that disappointment um, laying her down because she was my idol, you know. Uh, and so I ran away from home. I I suffered uh, a lot of uh, nights, cold nights on the streets and a lot of uh, dangerous situations. Um, my mom opened up the doors to me, and uh, I'm so grateful for that. She's a wonderful woman. Um, but for many in our community, that, that isn't the option they have. They're, they're rejected from their families. Many of the uh, undocumented youth out there are still living uh, on the streets because they're LGBT as well. And so it's unique. It's not more difficult or the other, but it is a unique experience we have to go through. Yeah, I think I think many of us, you know, we come in seeing our parents sacrifice everything they have, and you know, there's that fear of the family acceptance and how that's going to react. And maybe, um, Alan, maybe you can speak more about it of your personal experience, and also since I think you are working heavily on the family acceptance portion of things, maybe you can speak a little bit more on, on that specific part as well. Um, I mean, I came out as queer first, and that's just, I was, I grew up in Boston, and I moved to the suburbs, and in the suburbs, I went to a really white school, and it was always that trauma of me not having to, not being able to share my undocumented status because I didn't speak English, and because I'm Afro-Latino, they thought that I was a Haitian migrant, so the ESL teacher I had only spoke French, so I had to learn French before I learned English, so it was that idea of if I tell them that I'm uh, Latino, they're going to know that I'm illegal, right, or that I'm undocumented. So it was that idea of repress your undocumented status as much as you can so that the school doesn't find out that you're undocumented. Um, so I come out as queer first, and it's pretty white, and queerness a lot of the time has been associated with having been colonized and being this white thing. Um, so people were understanding to a certain extent in my family, was very confused. They didn't really know what it was. Um, and the first thing that came to their mind was, oh, well, we don't have the money for you um, to, get a, uh, um, to get an operation, um, to get like, your penis removed. That was their first reaction. So it was really like, holy shit, like, you know, like, our, like my family, like, I'm trying to tell them that I'm queer, but they don't really understand the concept, so it's that idea of really telling them exactly what it is that I want for myself to be happy. Um, and so first of all, a lot of just like going back to what it actually means and what I need from them and from my community to be able to be, able to be okay. And then I come out as undocumented, and because it is primarily white place that I'm living in, People don't know what it means and automatically associate me with a terrorist. And I was actually um, told by a teacher in this place where I came out undocumented that I should be put in a box and should back to the country where I came from. And another person told me that somebody like me was never going to get anywhere in life. So it's that idea of growing up, uh, growing up black 
in a white suburb and having to oppress my undocumented identity, but being somewhat somehow accepted as a queer person. It's a very unique experience, and it, a lot of it depends on space and the population you're in. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, the it's definitely a very different perspective growing up from the East Coast to the West Coast, and I think, and just the location where we're where, where we're placed. Um, um, Dago, maybe you want to share a little bit of how you know what was your experience coming out? Sure. So. Um, I first came out as undocumented because back in 2006 because we had um, Proposition 300 that was looking to bar undocumented students from going to um, college, right? So, um, so I started organizing uh, for for us to take down this this law, which eventually passed, um, and we're still fighting it to this day in Arizona. So, um, but I don't think it was as hard because I felt I had a support system. And it wasn't as scary, right? Because we were creating conversation, and there was um, there were other spheres that I could relate to, and we would talk about our struggles and our feelings, right? Um, I think for me it was harder to come out as um, queer just because of the uncertainty, because I didn't really have any undocumented queer role models, right? I didn't really understand what it meant to be gay, um, to be queer. So um, it was very scary, and I think. Um, looking and hearing at the numbers, I think it makes sense that um, people decide to come out as undocumented first and then queer, and because you have so many laws set in place that unconsciously are putting us in these closets, right? And I think um, that's a conversation we should also have, right? What what kind of legislation legislation is being passed that is actually putting us and keeping our younger um, brothers and sisters that identify as LGBT in the closet, right? Because I think that plays a, a key role into when people come out and why they come out and why they don't come out, right? And especially here, um, us being Latinos, uh, and I can only speak for myself, right? But I didn't have a lot of knowledge as to um, to laws and all of this, but I did hear all the negative stuff, right? Um, so the negative definitely overtook the positive. So for me, um, I can say that it was coming out as queer, plus because undocumented is... A, a temporary status, right? But we're always going to be queer. So, um, so I think that's also difficult, right? It's a life-changing decision. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and I believe Luis is still on the call. Luis, are you still? Can you hear us? I think he might have. He might. Something might have happened. Um, but thank you. I mean, I think we all continue to. We all like you know. Alan mentioned there is very. You know different perspectives, especially where we're coming from, um, and that you know, just the spaces that we're in um, allows us to come out easier one place or another based on the support system that we have. And I think, you know, and I wish I slightly a little bit about my story. I think for me, um, there we always you know we go through the identity crisis that we're trying to figure out if we're if we're queer or not. You know, what does it mean to be queer, and for me specifically, there was no, not even like a gay queer white man or a gay you know queer white woman. I just didn't have that around my space. So my space was surrounded by you know brown people that looked like me, and it just became easier for me to identify and have support systems like that. But as I grew older and I still started to question my identity, that's you know um, the education part took place, and that's when I found the courage to like really come out as queer. Um, Great. I think uh, hopefully uh, um, Luis can join us. But uh, great. So I mean, I think as we continue moving forward and as we continue to talking about the support systems that our net our community, you know, has been able to create, and especially for the Indaka queer community, um, I wanted to speak on this on this thing that people talk about. So there's this notion that for LGBT communities things get better, and I wanted I wanted to know if that is something that rings true to you. Um, and it goes back to there's been support systems that have been in place by the, by other organizations um, for things to get better. If there's just you know how do things get better for you, and if they haven't you know what have you done? Um, and maybe you want to start off, Alan? Um, yeah, I think that that it gets better. It's I mean for me I don't think it's true. Um, I remember just a few months ago it was about six or 
seven months ago, I was had no place to live, and you know, I was in New York, and I tried to go to a homeless shelter, and because I didn't have status, they couldn't take me, you know. So it was that idea of, oh wow, like this is a queer homeless shelter, but because I'm undocumented, they can't take me because it's federally funded. So it was just that idea of, holy shit, you know, like, when is it going to get better for me? So I had to resort to sleeping on the A train in New York, which is the longest train in the city. Yeah, I mean, any anybody else that wants to share that? <laughs> I think that, yeah, I think you're right on point. <laughs> um, maybe, I don't know, if Maida, you want to say something about if how are things getting better for you or if, they, if that actually rings true for you or what is your... You know, I, I again, it's, it's hard to um, imagine things getting better when you, um, you know, I, I, it's commonplace for someone to call me, for me to get a phone call in the middle of the night um, from someone back home saying that their parent has been picked up or... Um, their, their, you know, family member has been picked up by immigration. Um, and these are phone calls that, like, you know, it unfortunately, like, happen all the time. And so when, so when I hear, uh, you know, f folks in the LGBT movement say things get better, I just, I, I don't see how it's getting better when people are being, like, ripped from their homes and people are afraid to drive to work. Um, it's, no, I, I, I reject that idea, and I think there still has to be a lot of work to be done, um, in, in the LGBT movement about deportations and enforcement, because there are those out there that are convinced that deportation's not an LGBT issue, even though, you know, we, we are being deported and targeted and suffering from abuses in detention centers. So yeah, I, I don't agree with things getting better right now. I want to see things get better. I'm not trying to be like negative or cynical, but the reality is that right now under the Obama administration, things are not getting better for undocumented queers. Anyone else that wants to take up that question for the moment? Uh, yeah, I would like to add something. Yeah, go for it, Miss. Um, Maida, like, I totally agree with you. Um, so this is something that I've been battling back home and across the country when I speak to people and they're like, yeah, things will get better and things that people that want to like think about the positive things that have happened like um, through the policy and everything, but then you have to remind them that there's still deportation going on. There's still people back home. Like there's, I still have friends that are homeless right now who are LGBTQ who may not be undocumented, but I also have friends who are undocumented and LGBTQ who haven't even applied for DACA because they don't have the money. Um, I also have friends who are criminalized and are going through a lot of um, things with the um, justice system here and basically for being LGBTQ, um, not being able to find jobs, uh, their family rejecting them. On a personal level, I have lost some family members ever since I came out. And um, I missed the other question that y'all were talking about, um, about coming out as undocumented and queer, but it was harder to come out as queer. And when people tell me that things get better, I try to remind them about all these things that are in the back of my mind. And I'm like, no, they won't get better until we are fully equal, like everybody. And um, and it's especially harder on undocumented queer women um, who um, most of the time aren't seen as equal to men. And it's, and it's like in the LGBT community, it's like a privilege to be a gay man, but it's not like a privilege to be a... Um, a Latina or something like that, and that's something that we need to combat. Um, but it, it, that question makes me like upset because it doesn't get better until we do something to make it better ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Marco or Dago? Yeah, I'd say that rings really true. Um, you, it doesn't get better for the LGBT immigrant community because when uh, the priorities that we're focusing in on aren't on our community. When President Obama is signing executive orders around workplace discrimination, which is extraordinarily important for our community, um, we're always the community that is being left out. And so we're always the asterisk on his record, which is great on LGBT uh, issues, but we're always the asterisk 
when it comes to the LGBT immigrant community because we're being ignored. Um, there's uh, 7,000 individuals who call into our office here at Immigration Equality seeking help, and there's over 400 asylum cases that are open right now, and we're, we're being flooded by individuals who are every single day afraid of being deported to a country where their lives are in jeopardy. And this is what we're living through, uh, through an administration who generally just doesn't care, um, who, who doesn't really realize that delays can literally be life-threatening and dangerous to our community. And this is af from a personal experience. It doesn't get better for individuals who are fearing deportation, and it doesn't get better for individuals who have already been deported, who are part of our community. My little brother, I lost my little brother to deportation nine years ago. Nine years ago, my little brother, who is also gay, had to grow up in uh, Peru, in a country where he didn't feel safe being himself, um, being open, um, because he felt like he was going to be rejected from our extended family. He eventually was. He had to learn how to live off on his own, and he didn't feel safe um, to be out and proud in Peru, as, uh, as liberated as he was here in the United States. And so... Uh, so I think there's a lot of uh, inroads that we have to make to uh, um, provide our the safety and security that our community really deserves so things can actually really get better. Thank you so much, Marco. Yeah, I mean, I think you, I mean, I think you've mentioned already that there's countries that have anti-homosexuality anti laws and it just becomes even worse once, you know, people, our community are not addressing our needs. Um, anything you want to say, Dago? I mean, everybody's hit hit the ball, right? I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, there's a lot of underrepresentation from our community. Um, so yeah, until we are able to have um, to be present in these spaces and make sure that we're represented, then then it doesn't possibly it's not going to get better, right? If we don't have the people directly affected um, being part of the decision making, uh, then then it's not going to get better. Yeah. Carlos, and also I want to mention, you know, um, we haven't really touched on the point of what happens to our transgender and gender and gender nonconforming community, and you know, it's um, this summer one of our familia um, original board members, Soraida, was murdered behind a Dairy Queen, and she was a transgender undocumented woman, and it's that idea of when is it going to get better for our trans community? When is it gonna? When are we going to get to the day where we can walk on the street? And you know, not think about us being of color, not thinking of us being queer, not being of us being um, non-gender conforming and trans. You know, um, it's it's not just because we're queer. It's also this this idea of of trying to go and be yourself. That idea of trying to be authentic and living happily. Um, and also, you know, a lot of these murders, it has to do with the idea of, oh, well, you want to be a woman, that idea of a woman being lesser and that machista um, and very anti-feminist rhetoric. Um, it's a product of this transphobia um, that our undocu trans community has to go through. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, and that's why I think many of our, you know, the, especially the the responsive, you know, not responsibilities, but things that we as like a queers carry in our shoulders is there's just so many isms that continue to exist that we constantly have to fight. Um, we can't constantly have to continue. It's an uphill battle constantly. There's never like a rest. There's really never no victory. Even if even after we get you know uh, our immigration status fixed, there's still more to do. Um, and I think you know. It's this, what you said, Alan, I think it's being able to live with authenticity in who we are and for, you know, our neighbors to be, to be able to respect that and acknowledge who we are. Um, and it's not even about validation towards them, it's about us and about being free in our own, in our own skin. Um, thank you. I mean, the next question that I wanted to ask for you all is, is, you know, I, I constantly hear in many places that, you know, we can't mix the LGBTQ movement and the immigrant rights movement because they're two very separate issues. I mean, I think you are a living, exp a living um, 
an example that that's not true because <laughs> we're all undocumented and we're all like LGBT. So um, I wanted to know more about, in your eyes, what are the, the strong parallels of the movement um, and also how and what are the, some of the shared values on your perspective within the LGBT, LGBTQ rights movement and immigrant rights movement? What are the, some, some of the shared values that we hold? Um, and also, how are they inter intersectional? And, how, and you know, why is it them two coming together will make a stronger movement? So maybe we can start off with uh, Dago. Sure. Um, so um, my thoughts on this idea is that we can't possibly be fighting for equality and justice and having buts, right? Like, but if you're this, we're not going to, right, because essentially equality and justice is not gained that way. I think um, that in order for us to to continue to push forward, whether we're talking about queer issues, um, women reproductive issues, um, being an uh, underrepresented community, we really need to look at what, what equality means, what justice means on a broader level, and really make peace with all of our limitations and judgments, right? Um, I do believe that there is this, um, because a lot of funding and a lot of the politics that goes into pushing movements through, I think that's that's going to be one of our biggest challenge um, because we have these organizations that are getting funding from X, Y, and Z, right, that don't necessarily agree with the platform of incorporating a queer identity. Um, and that, that can be very dangerous, and I think we've seen the um, the underrepresentation of the undocumented queer people, um, and, the, and it's due to politics and it's due to funding. So I think um, one way to really combat this is to really um, understand that in order to make our movements more powerful, we need to come together as people. Um, but I do see that there is a disconnect, right? And I think that's why it's extremely important, the work that we undocumented queer people do to really um, bridge these two movements together because I think it's it's the same feelings, right? When you come out as undocumented and queer, right? I had those butterflies, that uncertainty when I came out as undocumented. I didn't know what was going to happen. I, I was afraid that I was going to get deported, right? Uh, and it, it might not be the same, but it's similar to me coming out as queer, right? And having this this um, fear of losing my family, of, of um, losing my friends, right? Uncertainty of having shelter, not having shelter, not having resources, right? And I think it, we, we have a very similar fight, right? I think um, it's just the things that we've grown up with and, um, and a lot of political things that get in between uh, really bridging this, these two movements. But I do see that um, soon enough we'll come together and we'll really talk about how we can um, work together to really push uh, our movements forward and be much more successful at it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> any, uh, anything else that you would want to say, Maida, or uh, anybody else from the panel? Um, I just wanted to add to the funding point because I'm a fundraiser and I love fundraising. I'm a fundraiser by training and I do believe that, you know, in order for us to see the liberation um, that, that we need, uh, to, in order to live exist in a, an existence that doesn't constantly feel vulnerable and uncertain, because I can say, you know, being undocumented, being a woman, being queer, being Latina, um, my entire existence is vulnerable, and I think that's probably, that's worked to my strengths in some ways, because I'm not afraid to be vulnerable, because, you know, the, the world I live in has made me vulnerable. So I think until we're able to become independent of foundations and build grassroots funding that comes directly from our community, um, will we have the autonomy to to move forward with the issues we want to move with without having to worry about, you know, losing funding or, you know, dismaying a foundation or anything like that. So, yeah, I, I believe funding is, is the root at all of it, and I think um, once we all get on board with that, maybe we can all become fundraisers too. I don't know. That's my dream. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure all our undocumented youth are good fundraisers because that's I, – I really do think that's the – that's the um, solution to a lot of the issues and the challenges we're facing in our movement right now. 
anyone else want to hit on, on some of those points or your points that you want to bring up? Yeah, I just wanted to bring up a really quick statement that I really love, and it's uh, about breaking chains of oppression, whether that be homophobia, racism, sexism. Uh, breaking our chains of oppression leads to our mutual liberation, and that's what we wish for our community. We want to see all of our community liberated. Um, we can't pick and choose who that is, who that's going to be. Okay. Anything you want to add to that, Alan, and like the... Um the shared values that we hold as LGBT movements and immigrant rights movements and the strong intersection and the need for an intersection. Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the things that we have to remember is that all oppression is connected and that in order for, like, me to be, li be liberated as a queer person, I can't be liberated unless my, you know, my fellow, like, immigrant or woman is liberated, you know? Like, my liberation is tied to the liberation of all these other communities that are currently being marginalized by the system. Um, and also, I think that health is a really big, important thing in both of our movements, you know, because without our mental health, we can't do the work that we're doing, and we can't continue to build those bridges of intersectionality. And I think that that's, a, like, us, not, us as undocumented people not being able to have access to health care, I think it's a strategy to... To keep us at our, our level as subpersons, you know, and as these people that should just be working, um, and also as queer, to to continue to repress that that mental health, that you know, all those other all those other factors that we have to think about on a daily basis just to survive, but not even to live yet. Because when I'm at at least me, I'm not at that level where I can live, knowing that my stepfather has a deportation order, but I'm queer, my mother hasn't had health care in years, you know? Yeah. I think that that's something that we, it's been a, a, a factor that we haven't prioritized, especially the health component. Like, you know, we, there's so many things that are, again, are in, you know, in our shoulders, and the system has been very intentional on making sure that we don't, prioritize health because they continue to throw in like rocks at us and we just continue have to, having to dodge them before we take care of ourselves. So completely agree. Um, anything that you want to share, Luis, on this? Yeah, um, for me, it feels like we're a small bubble within another bubble, um, especially for whenever I'm talking to people and they are, they're LGBT and they're like, okay, I get, I get it, like, I get where you're coming from and I get how you're oppressed. But then once they realize about my undocumented status, it's like, okay, whoa, like that I don't agree with. Like you and then it's it's all because of like how the media is like sharing the um the myths of the undocumented immigrant, right? And until so we don't break down those barriers and start speaking out about like what the intersection actually is is that we are also human beings and that we are also um, oppressed not by only the people who don't like us for being undocumented but also by the people that may like us for being undocumented but don't like us for being LGBT. So it's like, okay, you're my friend now but then later once you find out about my other identity you may not be my friend and you may not support me. And the same goes with the like support, your support system that you have at home. Um, so like Let's say if, if somebody here from Yakinville, North Carolina has the support because they are undocumented, but once they come out as LGBT, like, that support system is gone. And that's something that I've seen like on a daily, like, face-to-face -face here. Um, so breaking down those barriers and letting people know, like, no, the person that you saw before you found out about that identity, that's who, like, the human being is that you were supporting before. Um, so how to break down the barriers to get people to not take a step back once they find out about our second identity um, and to fully support us and how we can f be fully equal um, on a federal level. And until we, until we start thinking about how we can build power within ourselves and not be afraid to come out um, and share our stories and our experiences and hold people accountable that are doing these things to us, like we won't build any power and we won't break down the fear that's already existing. Um, so, and it won't be until then that we can actually work together to win full federal equality. Thank you. So I'm going to ask uh, 
two more questions, but I, I want to remind it, remind the viewers that you can ask any questions on Twitter um, or through Facebook with the hashtag double coming out and tag United with Dream so that we are able to check on your questions. We have two great uh, moderators over here on the side that are helping us get those questions. So if you have any questions for the for any of these amazing folks, make sure you tweet at us um, at United with Dream with the hashtag double coming out and we'll be able to pick up on your questions. Um, so I'll ask the next question. Um, so now that we talked about it, it doesn't get better, right? We said, you know, some of the other organizations have not been able to, or some of the movements haven't addressed our needs yet. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to know more of what is your organization specifically currently doing, um, whether it's at a state level, at a national level, to make it better for our community, for our Ndaka queer community. So maybe you can speak more of the current projects that you're all working on. Um, if you want to, I mean... Do you want to start off, Marco, on this one? Sure. Uh, one of the things that we're working here at, at Immigration Equality is to really focus in on the national level to change the policies and practices that negatively impact our LGBT immigrant community. So we're really focusing, our priorities are on all decision makers, whether it's the administration who has the ability, authority, and responsibility to deliver the immediate relief that our community deserves, um, or when it, it's Congress and making sure that they're not being left off the hook and that whether it's Democrats or Republicans, we're keeping them accountable and there's midterm elections coming up and we're informing our supporters on where they're standing on the issue, whether it is um, uh, on LGBT and immigration issues, whether or not they support um, immediate relief uh, and we're up to date on that. And so, and when it comes to, to the Department of Homeland Security and ICE, uh, ensuring that that system that's dysfunctional and inhumane is being overhauled and uh, making sure that there's transparency and that our community doesn't continue to be abused in immigration detention centers across the country. So uh, um, we're going to start organizing on a local level around detention centers to really amplify the message that each day that is del is a delay um, is dangerous to our community. Uh, and uh, each day that there's a one more day that goes by without relief, uh, more individuals are put in, being put into risk of uh, detention and deportation that puts, places their lives at risk. And so we're keeping, we're messaging back that DHS is accountable, the president needs to act immediately, and Congress has a responsibility to give us a concrete and lasting solution to, through reform. Thanks so much, Marco. Um, any of anybody, Alan, you want to hit up on those notes? Yeah, um, well, some of the stuff that we're doing is um, really taking on that work of the one more, more, more um, multi-BTC immigrant work. Um, because a lot of our members at Camellia are trans folks that have been held in solitary confinement, that have been denied access to health care, and really um, going out there and trying to really highlight the idea that trans lives do matter um, and, you know, showing um, showing up at these places and not infiltrating spaces but just holding people accountable on the years of trauma and violence that has been both cyclical and systemic in the trans community of them um, not being able to live and also that idea of Sometimes we, we can't even get political asylum for that stuff because, you know, our, our countries are supposedly liberal or a city in our country is liberal, so political asylum is then out of the question because they can just move to that city in that one country. Um, so really taking on that idea of that trans lives matter and that we have to continue to fight these systems. Um, this incarceration industrial complex, right, and try to see if there's a way we can abolish the incarceration system. Thank you so much. Uh, anybody, uh, Maida, you want to talk about what is something that you all are doing? Sure. <laughs> At United We Dream, um, we're continuing to empower our undocu queers through the Queer Undocumented Immigrant Project, <laughs> making sure that we uplift the stories of our uh, undocu trans folks. And especially, I think, focusing on, on the consciousness raising that is needed back in our communities. I think right now, um, you know, it's 
I think very evident everyone on this call is on board with LGBT issues, but how many of us can go home and have the same kind of conversation with our parents over the dinner table? Um, so I think really deepening, the, having those deeper conversations with other folks from our community that do not identify as LGBT is of a priority, along with continuing to pre pressure President Obama and call him out for not delivering on his promise. Um, so that's, that's just what we're working on, working on with QUIP. Yep. Go for it, uh, Lago. You want to go up next? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, and the Arizona Equip chapter f currently is teaming up with our Korea's Liberation team, and we're focusing um, a lot on really, um, like what Marco said, right, um, the importance of really um, getting or undocu queer brothers and sisters out of detention centers, right, and how uh, no LGBT person deserves to be in detention centers. Um, other than that, we're working on building resources to really providing um, opportunities for membership development and what that looks like. And also, I think one of the very important things is housing, right, especially in Arizona. Um, what, how can we make sure that we're supporting or members who are getting out of a detention center, right? Where are they going to go? And possibly providing some sort of temporary housing and not just um, detainees, but also or undocumented queer brothers and sisters that, that are afraid to come out, right? And I think if they had a safe place where they could go call home, they would be more likely to come out and um, truly start being themselves. So um, that's some of the work that we'll be doing. Um, Luis, or I think any of you, anybody else want to talk about that? Yeah, um, like I said earlier, like local grassroots organizing and um, leadership development is something that we're trying to work on right now, especially with undocumented uh, queer immigrants that identify as undocumented queer but don't have like much organizing um, skills, so like helping them on a local level so that we can bring these presences and, and places that, um, that don't currently have anything going on right now. So, um, so we're looking into possibly tapping into places like Alabama, Mississippi, um, and other states. Um, so it's like the work goes hand in hand with Quip, right? Raising these stories and um, um, empowering the undocumented queer immigrants so that they can win local um, battles and so that whenever there is the time we need to um, call for full federal equality that we have a base that we can do it with and work collectively and like Maida said, like having those conversations with the parents and people that are in our community um, like teachers, um, city council members, stuff like that and like just bringing the awareness like locally where it's not at. So. Thank you so much, Miss. Um, we do have a question right now from it's from United We Dream Tampa Bay, and their question reads: um, What kind of support can we count on when we start to work on LGBT issues locally? So this is in Florida. Um, what type of support from your uh, individual organizations can um, can you know when people start doing local work? How can you support that work? So I don't know if someone wants to. I can say something real quick because I know UWD Tampa Bay and I think they are all talented organizers. Um, I was privileged to be um, able to train some of the founders of UWD Tampa Bay and I think they already know this but I would be happy to train them and provide any sort of community organizing training or guidance they feel like they might need. Um, because I do believe that the area they live in is very key, Plant City. Um, if you've ever had strawberries, folks, it prob and the strawberries were from Florida, they probably came from UWD Tampa Bay's community. Um, so I think as far as support and resources, that's something I can definitely commit to doing for them, because they're awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um. I'd love to go next because I'm from Florida as well, and I love UWD uh, Tampa Bay. They are all wonderful, wonderful people. Um, I'd just like to say what type of support would you want? What type of support do you need? Um, I want to meet you where you're at, and uh, whether that be connecting you with the LGBT organizations on the ground that I already have connections with, or providing you with resources to organize, to connect with media, to to really uplift what you 
the causes and things that you're doing in the community. Our focus here at Immigration Equality 100% of the time is on LGBT immigration. So uh, um, our capacity and bandwidth is there to be able to support and provide the resources that anyone needs. And uh, right now I can just say if you ever um, are seeking more support or seeking where where to take next steps to take action for our community, you can email me right at marco at immigrationequality.org and I'll get right back at you. So thank you so much for that question. <laughs> um, as also for wanted to add. And Luis, I wanted to also know, you know, UWD Tampa Bay, but just any other local organization around the state that might want to say, hey, I really like what these uh, young leaders are doing or what these undergraduates are really bringing up, how, you know, what they want to, how would they start you know, by doing some Anaku queer work. Maybe you can also hit up on those topics. When you were, I think you were speaking, sorry. Um, yeah, so this is some of the work that, that Gate Equal is wanting to do. Um, so definitely I can commit to helping anybody who is interested. And y'all can also email me at luis at gateequal.org. Um, and just to provide the support that y'all need, like on an organizational level where y'all are at, and so we can help y'all like the trainings and skills that y'all need. And also um, draft crafting that story that y'all need, um, so that you are able to do outreach and um, raise raise the awareness of um, the undocu queer immigrant. So hit me up, <laughs> Alan. You wanna? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. No, so for Familia, we have um, some queer, trans, direct organizing trainings that we would we would be more than happy to share with, and also. If you're interested, we do have curriculum on family accepting trainings, um, or we could even go down there if you have a group of around 20 folks that want to, or parents and um, children, um, anybody in your community that wants to be part of the training, we can definitely do that. Um, so yeah, uh, anything can be you know, to info at familiatqlm.org. Perfect. Thank you so much, y'all. I think, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you want to say something, Dago, I thought that you were gone. <laughs> you, want to you want to talk about maybe what is something that, maybe I know that you were, you know, you did a lot of helping on, the, on within AZ Equip, you know, how does someone start doing a knuckle queer work? Um, yeah, I, I do believe that the first step is really identifying uh, what issue you want to concentrate on, right? What, what is most important in, in your community, uh, in your state? What is the change that you ultimately want to see, right? So, um, and I think you go from that, right? I think we have a bunch of great people here who are willing to, uh, to support the work that Florida decides to do um, equally here in any way I can help them. Um, please reach out. Um, but I think it's extremely important to really um, sewn in on what what Florida wants to work on and then from there it's like really reaching out to the different organizations that can provide resources right and I think the most important thing for any movement is asking right when you're starting we must learn to ask for help lots and lots and lots of help so yeah <laughs> I mean I remember I know that I like I, I don't I mean I, I feel like I sound like a broken record, but we do especially in the queers continue to hold this like big you know weight in our shoulders because we are constantly having to address two strong movements, two stigmas, and we're trying to not only educate like the overall community but even our families, ourselves. So there's a lot of internal learning that we have to do. Um, you know that no one else is providing that learning for us. You know, I even the the curriculum from the K to 12 system. Nobody's teaching me what does gay mean. Uh, nobody's teaching me what does a gay mean to be a Latino, um, or in then gay gay Latino to be undocumented. So nobody's teaching me how to do that. So I think that that's something that all of us in this. So I think that Carlos' uh, screen froze up, uh, and so uh, can you all hear me, uh, Luis? Uh, yeah. Okay, great. 
So until uh, Carlos gets back, just really quickly, I think the last question that we really wanted to address is what is the message you want to tell other undocumented uh, LGBT, young undocumented LGBT folks? And so uh, um, if you could drive home one message to any, any individual out there listening who's, you know, just going through the process of coming out of the closet or coming out of the shadows, what would that be? Myra? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, so I wanted to say from personal experience the most powerful transformative and therapeutic thing that's ever happened to me has been getting involved um, in, in the movement. Uh, so I think what ma would make the most sense is to get involved because you build a community behind you when you're doing this kind of work and really that support is so valuable whenever you're going through the process of coming out. Uh, so I would say yes, get involved and um, take, it, take it slow. Don't feel pressured to rush coming out because every person needs to go through their own process. Um, but definitely make sure you're bit by bit building that community behind you uh, because it's going to be important in the long run. Yeah, I just build off of that. I was going to say that, you know, I almost gave up on life, um, that there is hope out there, and that the movement saved my life. I'm just saying exactly what Mitre said. Um, get involved. If you feel like you're missing something in your life, if you feel depressed, if you feel down, if you feel like you're stuck, um, community is there. Um, community is out there to really support you, to really uh, um, fully embrace you, your full identity, your, your authentic self. And that's what it's done for me. And I just encourage you to really uh, not only get involved, but feel empowered to really represent yourself and uh, um, be proud of who you are um, because you're a beautiful, complex, and like all of us, re really. Um, dynamic individual and uh, just don't give up because there there is hope at the end of the tunnel and we're all fighting for that that piece of hope that our community deserves. Yeah, I, think I just good. wanted Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to add there's this saying that I really like it's like you can't win the race if you're not in the race. Um, so like Marco and Mayra said, like you you need to get involved not only to save yourself but to save other people, um, and that is the whole reason why I decided to come out was so that I could be um, the voice for my community and for other people that are in my community that are um, struggling through being in the closet who are LGBTQ or undocumented, um, and just being there to tell somebody that you are there is a lot of help. Um, I came out because I actually had an individual who was part of my community come out as undocumented and LGBTQ. And that empowered me to come out and no longer stay in the closet, and which was a very frightening place, and the movement saved my life. Um, and together as a community, we can win the race. So, um, so take it step by step, and it's, it's a beautiful process because once you find out who you are and you start building the power, the possibilities that are endless and nobody can ever stop you from winning. Um, for me, I think that, you know, one of the biggest things that has allowed me to be in the movement is that idea that winning is winning, you know, and sometimes losing is winning and to know that that's okay, that we're going to lose sometimes, but as long as we're doing it in a community, we're going to be learning a lot. And it's not easy, you know, like I have PTSD, but after being involved in the movement, after about five years of involvement, you know, my nightmares have reduced because I have that community there out there for me. And it's not the easiest thing. It's, it's going to drain you, but you're going to come out of it with such a different perspective. And for me, at least, like no one ever taught me how to love my queer black body, right? And to finally understand that me being queer and black is a beautiful thing. Um, just like to remember that you are beautiful.
Thank you so much, Marcos, for continuing that. My my call had dropped. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the last part. I mean, we're about to close up to the end, and I wanted to to bring up the the importance that you know. Remember those numbers that I said. There's only 36% of us that have come out as both undocumented and LGBT, but there's still 32% of us that have only come out as undocumented and not LGBT. 14% that have come out as LGBT and not undocumented, and 18% have not come out as either. Um, and I think now, as as we're doing more of this more of this work, I've gotten messages, I've gotten calls from many you know many people, where we're hearing that. There's folks that are undocumented and queer, and their parents have kicked them out. Um, what is a word, of, a word of advice that you would tell these young, you know, these young people that are out there that are still undocumented, that are still in the closet, that have not gotten the, you know, 